Views and opinions of any of the guests of After Hours AM are not necessarily the views and opinions of After Hours AM, its hosts, its staff, or any of its affiliates. Broadcasting live from the After Hours AM studio, Joel Sturgis and Eric Olson. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to this first edition of, well, March, <laughs> After Hours AM. Yeah, it's the middle of March. It's the 21st. But we are back at it, and we are happy to do so. Right, Eric? Absolutely correct. Yeah. And I am Eric and I'm Joel Sturgis, and we're here to rock the house for the next two hours, so go hit the lights, kick back, relax, because we're taking you to the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, located in beautiful Cleveland. It is happening. Yeah, top of next hour. We had them on once before, now they've moved to a new facility, and they got some new exhibits and stuff like that, so it's going to be creepy goodness right there be a lot of fun it, i'm very excited about it. i've been seeing some of the pictures from the the facebook feed and the new location definitely much bigger they really were squeezed into this little closet basically before and so now they can bring out a lot more of the stuff because this collection from raymond buckland himself uh, hence the name is mm-hmm. massive there's tons it's of huge stuff. it's huge and, and his own his personal archives are are massive as well, and that's really what Stephen has been digging into lately, and, and able to show so much more of. So yeah, really excited. They're actually opening reopening tomorrow. It's kind of a soft opening. They're not going to do the big whoop de doo brouhaha till April. But of course, being on this show, that's a whoop de doo brouhaha. Uh, that's right. They're 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 doing it up correctly. Come on, let's just be honest. Coming on radio, it doesn't get bigger than that. You're Man. open. We know you're open, so you might as well enjoy the Buckland if you are in Cleveland. But if you can't get there, at least take a virtual tour with us tonight. It's some creepy, creepy stuff. It's amazing stuff, and we we talked about some of it last time, of course, but we're going to get into some new materials and some of the new stuff that uh, Stephen, he's the director, has been finding as he's combing through these archives because these are massive archives. Sure. Stuff he- Ever seen before. He's, you know, with thousands and thousands of pages of stuff. So he's found a bunch of new stuff, and I know he's really excited about it, and he wants to talk about it and tell us about the new location. It's not that far, it's only a few miles from the old location, but he has much more room. And also, the other thing as well, I, I, will leave, I will leave that. Um, to uh, to the interview itself, he has one more bit of uh, information to share with us that shows how serious he is about this reopening. Also, really big news: just a couple weeks ago, I think it was maybe two weeks ago, um, the museum was featured on uh, Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum. Oh, very cool! Very cool. That that's pretty big because that's a great show. I, I love it's that. It's a great show. show. I do too. Very interesting show. So that's top of next hour. Don't go anywhere. Have a little fun with us touring the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Magic with a K, by the way. You know, oh, so. Nat with a CK. Yeah, with a CK. Now, Eric, do you ever shop in thrift shops? I mean, do you ever stop by these little you know thrift shops and go, hmm, that looks really interesting. I do. Um, usually I'm more accompanying the other members, in particular female members oh, yeah. of family. Yeah. But you know what I do like? Um, I like the ones that, that aren't so heavy on on clothing, which yes. you know, when you say thrift shop, that tends to bring up more clothes. Mm, I, I like the ones like that are called more like an antique mall kind of thing. And it's not – 
antiques per se, but it's just the cool, weird knickknacks, like the yeah. mummy and the monkey shop. Exactly, stuff you kind of stumble into. But there's a thrift shop that's run by Habitat for Humanity in North Carolina. And get this, they made $1,000 off a hand-carved bedroom set. And I know you guys are saying, yeah, so, big deal. Yay, it was haunted. <laughs> well, that, that's a lot for a used. It, it is, but it was bedroom. Set. It was so expensive because it's haunted. Come so on, they it, got. Not only was it not discounted because it was haunted, yes. there was a premium. The, there on seems it to be now. It was haunted. There seems to be now. If you slap haunted on anything, you can raise the price. My microphone just became haunted. <laughs> just well, now. I'll tell you what, that really, we've talked about this many times with, with various guests and, and amongst ourselves on the show, just how much the, the mood and the atmosphere has changed. And, and regardless of what you think about any or all of the haunted investigation TV shows, and by now, you know, there, there's certainly a glut of them, and um, it hasn't been anything like real new for a while uh, in terms of the no. format. It's the same show over and over, just the different bases, really. Ba- you know, know. kind of, with, with some variation, but you yeah. Know. I mean, this... in reality, yes. But regardless of what you think about them as show, TV shows or as entertainment, uh, and I, I think we're all kind of waiting maybe for the next big thing because something will come along that will be different yeah. and kind of recapture the public's attention. I think it's kind of waned. It's, it's, the, the audience is down to a more hardcore crowd again, whereas for a while there, it was It, it was, was all blowing crazy. up, man. 2004 yep. came, blew the doors up, everything, and it stayed steady for a lot of years. They had a hell of a run. For that several kind, years. Several years, so that's a hell of a run. You can get that but, kind of run of any genre of TV. That's doing real well. Absolutely. Especially, again, something that tends to be somewhat repetitive. Boring! <laughs> Not boring. Just <laughs> Come repetitive. on! How uh, long do you sit there and stare at a green screen and go, I heard that noise, too. I heard it in the background. I, ha- I have to admit, my viewership of said shows has fallen off somewhat mm. in, recent, in recent years. Yeah. Anyway, my yeah. point is, the... Um, it, it, those shows and the popularity of those shows really did push all things haunted, and 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 mere and the mere existence of ghosts, just uh, as a concept, it mm-hmm. really pushed things forward and in much more into the public eye, and made a lot of these more fringy things and you know travel related and sure destination related much 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 more popular. exactly it sure has travel is a big thing now it is huge uh news outlet reports to that habitat for humanity rowan county's restore warned would-be customers that the previous order reported he and his wife had continuous nightmares while the furniture was in their bedroom. Their dogs were also suspicious of the 1950s high boy chest and drawers and canopy bed. Well, as they would not stop barking at it. Dogs know stuff. Dun, dun, dun. My dog dogs barks at nothing. Stuff. My dog's nuts. I have a six-month-old lab, and she barks at nothing. She barks at her own shadow. She barks at anything. Anything. She barked at me once for a half hour, and I've been in the house all day. <laughs> well, as we have also discussed, we have a Chico. And Chico is a very excitable boy. He has calmed down to a certain extent, but it takes very little to yes. for him to yes. go bonkers. Well, with a name like Chico, would you expect any less? I would not, and we get no less. Well, anyhow, the stories are more. <laughs> you get a lot more, and that's why you no longer have carpet in your house. The oh, store's director of operations, Eliz- Elizabeth Brat- uh, Brady, says two regular customers were intrigued and paid full price, but didn't believe the furniture was actually haunted. So I would like to hear an update. They, yeah, sh- they should I- come back with an update going, it was so haunted. The dog would not shut up, and it urinated. (laughs) Well, so, now wait a minute. They were intrigued. They were intrigued. I mean, really, yeah, they're like, we'll buy it. We don't care. 
haunted or not haunted, but we really don't think it's haunted. You know, come on. How can it be haunted? Now, there has been a lot of people in the past that have gone to garage sales, thrift stores, even estate sales, especially estate sales, I've heard, that pick up a lot of items that might have an extra attachment with them. And that's not anything that is really uncommon these days. Come on, they had a whole show, a shortly lived show, all about it. Right. Well, if it's Haunted Collector, that wasn't even that short. I think no. they had three, three did, full seasons. Did they have I three believe. seasons? I can't remember. I they think three. they did. It was not a bad show. It was it was pretty good. But, you well, know, like- one show that's on right now that I'm kind of shocked at how many years it's been on is the one with Amy Allen on it. Not because it's bad or anything, but Dead Files. They might be the longest show now. If I'm not mistaken, on Other television. Other than Ghost Adventures. Yeah, those two, I think, are the two ones that kind of came out when it was still really hot. I think people like... The, the, the things that are different about that show are, number one, they they do only go to actual people's homes. And yes. now those people who have solicited their help are... In peril. So there's drama to it. You know, these people feel threatened. Some have been physically harmed. Lots of psychological and emotional harm. Lots of oppression. All that kind of thing. And usually the people are in a situation where they don't, they can't afford, um, you know, to get out, to sell it. Mm, and and they, they feel like they, you know, they don't really have anywhere to go. And that this is my house and I'm going to hang on to it. So they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I think that's the first thing. It's they they don't go to you know famous quote unquote haunted locations. These are people's homes, um, and people who are having actual real life issues. So that's number one. Number two, it's an interesting blend of Amy Allen being a really really believable high end psychic medium, mm-hmm. uh, and then and then of course Steve being the um, former homicide cop exactly. Who thing from an investigative standpoint it's so you goodness. got that going for him yeah and and um it, it just feels more real it's and haunted helping hands is what it is it, it is <laughs> and they're good at it they you know are, they're, they're good at it interesting believable personalities um but i agree it is it is pretty surprising how long it's kind of is. Now, we have Amy coming up on the show in the near future. We do. So we do. We'll, we'll have to talk with her about that, the longevity factor, and how long they've been on. It's just nuts. And in other news, well, Dog accidentally runs half marathon and finishes in seventh. <laughs> well, a huge <laughs> advantage, four legs. Well, a clever canine demonstrated her running prowess after accidentally finishing, accidentally now, Finishing seventh in a half marathon. <laughs> Some people train ahead of time for months to be able to run a marathon, but not this dog. Yeah, she was left outside her own devices when she had to go pee. <laughs> <laughs> a canine from Alabama has become an internet star after running a three thirteen point one mile half marathon and finished an impressive seventh. She would have finished sooner and more to the top had she not stopped to smell a fire hydrant, they say. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> being a dog and all. They, had, they actually have pictures posted, and they did give her a medal for finishing seventh. She legitimately won, but much to the chagrin to the other runners, that really was not fair. She does have four legs, after all, and not two. So, you know what they should do? Hmm. Since she has twice as many legs, they should double her time. <laughs> they, they should, and had it not been for the fire hydrant, I bet you she would have won. <laughs> oh, I bet you she would have won. She didn't even enter, though. It's kind of cheating. Distracted. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of cheating in a way. Well, it was cheating. It. What was really cheating was putting that fire hydrant there well, to distract her. Yeah, that is true. That is true. The poor pooch would have had it in the bag. Yeah. Until that happened. Much and, bigger trophy. Uh, I know. I know, right? Minneapolis man offers a cemetery to the city, by the way. You want a cemetery, he's giving it away. So, Eric, get in there now. <laughs> uh, why is he giving it away? A uh, funeral home owner in Minneapolis, Minnesota, would like to give away his 140-acre cemetery to the city because of the cost of running it. 
It's a That's really a a, big cemetery. He, he's quoted as saying it's a really a dead end, dead end operation. Oh, God. <laughs> and he says it may seem like uh, a business that will never die because the people never stop dying. Well, the, the people, puns never stop. They, anyway. they just do not. The funeral home owner, Bill uh, McReevy, opened some eyes this week at the Minneapolis City Council Transportation Committee meeting when he said this. If you'd like to receive Crystal Lake Cemetery as a gift for my family, we'll give it to you free of charge. Huh. Wow. The historic Crystal Lake Cemetery in North Minneapolis has 140 acres, and it also has a garden. Hmm. I wonder what the property taxes are. Ah, the, the, it is estimated to be worth $300,000. Huh. Well, that's not that much for 140 some not acres. Not really a prime real estate in the city. What I would be doing is I would be so poltergeisting that thing, you know, new development, <laughs> baby. <laughs> what? What buried here? What? What? You just no moved the stones. Here. You just moved the headstone. No one's buried here. Uh huh. Really. That's uh-huh. a myth. Yep. Well, That's according a wild canard. And, and here's another reason why he is looking to get rid of the cemetery. According to National Funeral Directors of Association of America, cremation in Minnesota has risen forty nine point five percent in twenty ten to twenty eighteen, uh, bringing it. a projected sixty seven point four percent at the end of twenty nineteen. Well, it's amazing. I agree. Go ahead. I, I plan to be cremated, by the way. Well, I'm seeing it in my own life. I mean, my parents, you know, in their 80s, uh, uh, again, everyone knows, both my mother passed away. We have her service this Saturday um, a couple weeks ago. My dad about a year and a half ago. Uh, If you would have told me that my mother would agree to having my father cremated, Mm -hmm. I never in a thousand years would have believed it because she's very traditional, in some ways even a little bit superstitious, very religious, yeah. and you know that just wasn't done. But it became a matter of practicality because we had to get Dad out to California for the burial. Well, storage and transportation. Mm-hmm. Oh my! You're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And, and really, so, and not to sound, not to cut you off, and not to sound like I don't care, but their remains could fit in a coffee can if you had to for transport. Seriously. Well, that's what we ended up doing because, every, you know, someone very gently presented to her the notion of, well, if if we had – because we, we did have a viewing with him. We did not with my mother, but we did with him. So at his service at the church, you know, five days after he passed away, I mean, he, he was there. Uh, and then And then he was cremated. So, I mean, she did get that part of it. But I think she also was responding – my mother responded to – People were really pretty skieved out by it. I, I yeah. don't think people are seeing bodies too much anymore. You Not know I mean? really. I know we had my dad cremated right away. He didn't have any kind of viewing or anything because that was his wishes. He, you know, he didn't want to be just laying around so people could gawk at him. See, so, you know, you want to go that route. Uh, but according to this article, it keeps going, and you know, by twenty thirty five, ninety four percent of all burials will be cremations. It's so much more practical. It's frankly a lot less expensive, uh, and and it is uh, overall much more green because you're not taking up all that space, mm-hmm. uh, and and you are not you know not to get too graphic, but you're not leaching toxic chemicals into the ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. I actually have my father in my house, his remains next to his oh picture. My. I do. I'm looking at him right now. In an urn. Hey, hey, what's up, dude? So that's what he wanted, though. He didn't want to be, you know, he wants his ashes spread with my mother's ashes when it comes time. Ah. Is what well, he wanted. And so that was thoughtful. Uh, and... I know, I know. See, so he hangs around my house. I see him every morning. And uh, next is picture. And some people would say, that is super creepy. Really kind of <laughs> get used to it. I'm it just creepy. becomes a fixture over there. We had Don, we had my wife's father um, in his container in in our house for about a year because it took that long to get uh, a service together 
here in Ohio to get so you know when all the relevant significant people could get here at one time. It was over a year after he passed away, yeah. and uh, so you know we brought his ashes back from Oregon, which is where he was when he passed away, and we we just had him here sitting in the living room for over a year, uh, you know, until we had the service. Uh, he is in a. Um, what do you, is it a crypt where they're in a wall? You oh, know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. It is kind of like a crypt. Yeah, exactly. I so used to volunteer he to uh, uh, I helped run a uh, cemetery at one point. And, um, well, not really run it. I was overseeing the crypts and stuff, you know, just kind of making sure nothing was cracked or broken, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, volunteer. I'd volunteer my time. But, yeah, that is the wave of the future. It really is. And yes, that is a crypt, by the way. And now you can fit. It looks like a big dresser made out of cement, in essence, basically. And and you might have 20, 30, 40 people in one crypt. Oh, yeah. He just has a little, basically, frankly, it's a cubicle, you know. Yeah. So, so, and so there's a couple of personal items. Um, you know, it's visible. I think it's behind glass, but it's visible. Uh, you know, as you can see the urn and you can see the items and, of course, his name and, and all of that. With my dad, I mean, they had owned or the family has had has owned something like I don't know what it is, 10 plots or something at in an actual cemetery for many decades. So that was preordained that he would end up at, out there. So he's actually buried, you know, in a cemetery, even though it's it's just the urn, you know, um, and and. <laughs> They still get you coming and going. Oh, yeah. Not, it's still not, not only do you have an urn, but you have to have an urn vault. <laughs> what? It's just ashes. It's sterile. Yeah, it's it's in a concrete vault. <laughs> See, now that's somebody doing a money grab right there because ashes it, are it's sterile. A it's a money grab. There is no... Yeah. We, we I've been through um, weeks... Uh, well, since she passed away, weeks worth of negotiations with this place saying, look, and she's going to be in the same plot as my dad. Mm -hmm. So we had already prepaid for the double. There's, you know, there's all these ridiculous oh, yeah. rules and up. regulations yes. and fees. Yeah. And even if you think you've paid for everything, they still somehow manage to find a way to charge you $2,500. Even if you've literally prepaid <laughs> yeah. for yeah, everything. you show up to talk to him. It's twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred, please. Yeah, right away, right then and there. Yeah, it, it is ridiculous. I do believe that those prices people kind of get away from paying that after a while once they realize that ashes are sterile, and there's nothing wrong with ashes. Uh, they, yes. It's literally dust, is what it is. So you know, you paid twenty five hundred dollars for dust I, to be it's, housed. It, it's it's, it's ridiculous. It's not even housed. It's just to be put in the ground. You That's know? it. That's it uh, right there. Anyway, anyway, that was down from, to be honest, I got him down from 4000 No, nah, you worked your plotted. magic. I worked them hard, actually. Yes. I, I guilted them a lot. Oh, because yes. They, there was a few issues with uh, my dad's um, burial. There were, there were a couple things. Uh, they didn't get his plate, his, his memorial plate. They don't have uh, grave stones. It's flat, you know, on the ground. Sure. Yep. Uh, um, so the whole thing. So so that's their aesthetic. So you see the grass, really. You don't really see the, ah, the okay. plates okay. until you're kind of right, looking, looking right down at them. Oh, yeah. It, it, well, they get you. I think my dad has a little bit of ashes at the cemetery with the family and that the headstone and everything else. Yeah, it's like a thousand bucks for a headstone. Just say, yep, he lays here. Yep, that's exactly. him. He's right there. Now I got they, oh. they didn't get our just to finish. They didn't get for there was a series of of issues and errors and miscommunications. They didn't get his memorial plaque. It may seem like a business year. that'll never die. Yeah. Yeah. A year. It, it's it's that's a long time. That seems like an absorbently long time. Yeah, it's get, a really long time. And that was things. my bargaining chip. Ah, look at you, Mr. Shrewd Businessman over there. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. Now, I, I got my own story here. Actually, this is news for myself, which is so odd, Eric. I, I, it's such an odd story. Now, the reason why we took a little bit of time off was, number one, because Eric lost his mom, but number two is I ended up having a heart procedure done. 
Now, it was kind of scary. I was scared. I had two different doctors. It was doctors. very scary. It was very Let's scary telling me that I had a 90% blockage that needed to be taken care of, which was quite serious. Serious to the point where they had me in surgery after they found the blockage. They had me two days later. I was on the operating table getting an angiogram. Well, so when I went and talked to the doctor pre-surgery, it was not if you have a blockage. It's how bad the blockage is. And are we going to have to bypass or are we going to end up putting a stent in? There was no talk of, well, maybe it's not there because two different doctors are trained, two cardiologists, radiologists, everybody else pointed this blockage out to myself and my wife. She was with me. This is where it is. This is what's going on. Okay. What do we do? This is what we do. Okay. Let's do it. They get in there. They cut me up, not once, Eric, but twice, Eric, to find nothing, no it is blockage. It's the strangest tale. It is miraculous it, it, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's just bewildering. Now, one of two things either happened. Either our medical science really sucks, and they couldn't figure anything out, or number two, a miracle. One of the two happened, and, and I mean, it was... Like, like really bad. It was not looking good. Uh, if I was not to get this taken care of in a short amount of time, they go in there, they get done the surgery, and they have to break the news to my just terrified wife, waiting to hear any news how it went. Yeah, there's no blockage. <laughs> what? <laughs> and she was so dumbfounded, they had to reassure her this is good news. Because, you know, like, wait a minute. We've had all these people tell us this is how serious it is. I know. And we go in. I'm getting ready to die, basically. Getting, I even talked to you about that a little bit. If things go south, this is, you know, what's going to happen. Da, da, da. Just it was, sure. it was a It was a grave situation. It, it truly was, and I cannot explain it. Um, I can't explain where this blockage went. I'm going to say there was one because I wasn't feeling the greatest. Now, there is a little bit of a weird side tale to this, and I haven't told anyone this, anyone this at all. The night before my operation, I was laying in bed. I mean, scared as all hell, going, oh, oh, you know, thinking of all those different things that could happen. Is this my last time? I'm going to be looking at my ceiling in my house. Yeah, those kinds of things. And I kind of just said, and now I don't know if you believe in God. If you don't, that's fine. If you have your own higher power, absolutely. I prefer, I actually believe in God. So I just kind of said, hey, big guy, I need your help here. I really need your help. Eric, I got so hot that night. I felt so warm. I felt like electricity was going through my body at one point. My God. And I associate it just with the blockage. Like, oh, here we go. Yep, yep. You know, making me feel warm and flush and not feeling good. Got up thinking, well, made it through that night, thank God. Go to the hospital and it's gone. Do they think it is possible that it actually broke loose? They, they, they were telling me if it would have broken loose, it would have gone into my heart. And, and, or or lungs or lungs or somewhere, they a blockage just now. From what I understand, what was explained to me, and, and, and maybe you guys have different because there's different kinds of blockages. So not one blockage is the same as anything else. I mean, they're just different kind of blockages. Mine was uh, what they were saying was more like the plaque blood kind. You know, where it would become a clot if it did, because right. the body would attack it and then make it become a clot basically because it wouldn't know what to do with it floating right. around there. So mine would have been a deadly, would have become a deadly clot had it broke off. Now I, I can't speak for every blockage that's out there or even how they react. I don't can speak for my certain situation. It, it, they did not want to, in fact, they are so dumbfounded. They had me going in for yet a, another um, echocardiogram. Just to make sure this is truly gone. Like, wow, did we really mess up this bad? You know, how did we not? It, it does it, really make them look bad. It kind of does. It kind of does. Uh, the, the case so, of the missing ex blockage. Exactly. And, and, of course, they try to downplay it a little bit. Like, yeah, yeah, and this happens. Had I not heard them whispering to each other, like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Had I not heard that, 
that little bit where they're whispering to each other like in shock, I, I would have believed maybe it does happen every now and again. And it might. Who knows? Maybe it does happen. Well, anything happens once in a while. Just a Exactly. I, I'm but just I mean, saying, yeah, for me, though, it was just so strange. Just so it, odd. I, I, if, if it were me, what happens when you, in those moments like, in the night before, like the night before the operation, when you're just you're alone with your you're alone with your thoughts. Uh, I mean, you're not literally alone, yeah. but you are alone with your thoughts, and your 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 mind is blank, and yeah. and you're just you're not forcing anything, you're not telling yourself anything. When you do that, or you're like that, what? comes to mind about what happened what do you think at the deepest level what does it feel to you i think it was intervention it sure sounds like i i I do i i really believe it was intervention and i only say that because there's multiple doctors seeing it multiple tests seeing it uh 3d imaging seeing it you know the gold standard in 3d imaging you know, right there, uh, they even did the dye, the radioactive dye stuff that they put in you. And there it was. You're like, there it is. And they show you in a 3D picture and, and just everything. And I, I, I got to say, if if I had to be honest to what I feel, I feel that there was intervention. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. And, and what, a, what, what a way uh, for... Whatever term you want to put, the supernatural or just grace or but, the spirit to touch you, to touch your life. But what's and, been and, weird, though, Eric, I don't mean to cut you off, but what's been weird is I've been way more empathic since it happened. Really? Yeah. It, it's I could pick up on people's emotions. Well, that is – I would say that – definitely lends credence it's, it's more to the spiritual side i would say yeah I, w- I would say so just kind of strange things have been happening to me a little little strange things that never were before you, you know but now i'm maybe it's because i'm thinking deeper maybe because i'm perceiving things maybe a little deeper maybe i took everything else for granted and that could right. be why you sure. know it, it might not be like psychic or anything maybe it's just me being just happy to be here, you know, and then taking everything in. Absolutely. Well, just thinking um, at, at a deeper level, li- living at a deeper level, realizing, I mean, it's, it happens to all of us. I, it doesn't matter who you are. In the world that we live in, the modern world that we live in, it's so fast. Everything, so much of our lives are are plotted out or calendared out you know we know we're going to do and even if we don't get to it we're supposed to get to it Mm -hmm. i mean from morning to night and when you're so busy with work and and various works and taking care of your your house and taking care of your family your kids i mean life is a whirlwind and unless Mm -hmm. you really do something and make a point of stopping periodically or at least slowing down periodically and thinking about the bigger picture and appreciating the here and now you know that's that's being present right in the here and now it's being it's not thinking ahead it's not thinking back and and that's one of the real benefits i think uh, you know besides the physical the stretching and whatnot sure. of yo- of yoga is it really does force you or it doesn't force you it gives you the opportunity to Take a break and yeah. stop and, yeah. and to clear your mind and to let things just kind of bubble up and to just listen to yourself and be reminded of what a miracle life is. Life is a miracle. And every single individual, every organic being, but of course we think, especially humans, each individual is a miracle. We're a statistical miracle. Mm-hmm. You are one of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of sperm that made it. Yeah. You're the one, man. Yeah. Think of the odds. That, the odds that is of you true. being you are extraordinarily low. And yet here you are. Yeah. Here we all are. Here are seven billion of us. That's so true. And it's one thing, though, one thing that really hit home now that I 
gone through what I've gone through. When I met people that have been staring down the barrel of their own mortality, and I, and, and I think my dad said it best, you don't truly live till you know you're dying. Of course, yes. You know, then every minute matters. Because you're matters. forced to. Yeah. Because you're forced to. Because you see things in a – now it's not – the, the future is not open-ended. We yeah. know intellectually that our lives aren't open-ended. There will be an end. But that's not how we think, or at least most of us. And that's not how we live our lives. We live our lives as though it just keeps going. Yeah, right? that's exactly true. We do. We, we act as if there is no end. Whereas if you are – and that's part of the argument of being much more attuned – to death and not ignoring it and and that's been the one of the big knocks against the you know quote unquote american way of death is to be afraid of it and Mm -hmm. to shun it and to fear it and to falsify it you know even just the the embalming and all of the the um you know the makeup tricks um used to to preserve and and to make someone you know oh he looks so natural no they never look natural no no, never, they, never, 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 not one no, time. No, they they never do. And I'm not sure if death is I, I don't believe that death is something we should be afraid of or want to run headlong to, but I think that we should enjoy the ride a little bit more than we do and and, and not take that, like you said, take it for granted that we're here. That we made it. Enjoy it. Think how many people who we've either talked to on the show or, or we've read about or just interacted with one way or another or just read their story um, of people who have had near-death experiences. It's always the same that you come away from it with a much deeper appreciation of the miracle sure. that, that is life. So true. And, and you don't take it for granted. That is so true, and that is what it taught me this whole ordeal, because everything you go through has an ultimate lesson, and and that's it right there, is enjoy life, because it's not forever. It is not forever, and don't take the things that are small for granted either, because those are the biggest things, and so there you go. Exactly. Try to live in the present. Don't dwell on the past. Don't be obsessed with the future. It is fine to plan. I have been told more than once in my life, I don't plan enough. I just assume things are going to work out. I do not carefully plot everything out, which a lot of people, including people in my family, do. And that isn't, you know, I'm not advocating for that either. But I'm saying that there is something to be gained by being in the present and mm-hmm. appreciating the present. And sure, there's always time to think about the future and plan for the future. And that is important. You can't, you don't want to be, excuse me, you don't want to be caught off guard. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's even our line of work. We talk about the paranormal every Thursday night. We talk to a lot of people that are looking forward to death, right? Not looking forward to it like, hey, I can't wait to die. But they're so intrigued by death that they're not taking the moment to enjoy today. Exactly, and, and, and what what they have today, they're all just all consumed about the after the hereafter, which I understand. There's nothing wrong with a healthy curiosity, but some of them. What I learned from going, well, why I went through is, man, you gotta sit down and just enjoy the moment. Go, hell yeah, this is awesome. You, you know, and, life and- is great. Absolutely. And, and I'm I'm so glad, you know, to hear that that is your takeaway from this, because I think that is really, really important. And just to realize how blessed we all are. And you've been given a, a, a you know, a special, a, a really, really specific, special blessing. But we're all blessed. We're blessed mm-hmm. to be here. And, and you, you reminded me of something that we've heard many times now from psychic mediums from people who have some you know communication with the other side who who travel on the other side who have uh you know spirit guides and on and on and we've talked to a dozens of people like that and every one of them comes back also saying the same thing and that is all of the people who are or all of the spirits or the entities that are on different planes 
and even living you know or living whatever you can call it existing in a state of of pure bliss they're envious of mm -hmm. us here on earth and they wish that we could appreciate how much we have here that we have physical bodies and the things that they can do and they can achieve and that they are for for however long we're alive they are our vessel and they are the 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 outward appearance of our life and that we are integrated into that and that having a body and being able to do all the physical things you know even painful things but of course sure. especially pleasurable things and and things that um are are meaningful with the body that that is something that people who no longer or entities again that no longer have a body or in between bodies depending mm -hmm. you know on your on your uh, philosophy, they really envy us, and and yeah. that we're here to make the most of it. So I, I'm I'm so pleased that that is, well, first of all, that it happened, obviously, because that's a wonderful thing, and that it literally has given you, you know, at at midlife or near midlife, uh, a new lease on life. Yeah. Yeah, it really has. I, I am no longer as wound as I used to be. You know, really wound tight. Everything's got to get done now, now, now. Everything's got to be perfect. Nah. You know what? It is what it is. Life is wonderful no matter how it pans out. Life is still special. We got to get out of here. We have to go break. We come back. We're going to do what's left of time with the America's Most Haunted Headlines. We didn't forget about that, but I just wanted to touch upon what I've been going through and, of course, what Eric's been going through. And we want to thank all the listeners for hanging tight well, we took a couple weeks off. Thank you guys so much for all the prayers that you've given both of us, and we do appreciate all of it. We'll be right back right after this. Ranger Station, Ranger speaking. Yeah, hi. I'd like to report a bear sighting. Location? My backyard. Oh, your backyard. Try telling a bear that. I did, and this bear talked back. Talking bear, that's rich. No, wait, it was Smokey Bear. Smokey? Why didn't you say so? I did say so. Continue. I was burning yard waste. No, boy. He told me to burn legally and responsibly, and to remember that if it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. And as always, he's right. You know, 9 out of 10 wildfires are caused by humans. That means 9 out of 10 wildfires can be prevented. Yeah, I know that now. Thanks to me. Actually, thanks to Smokey. As usual, the talking bear gets all the credit. Get your Smokey on. Always burn responsibly and contact your local fire department for open burning regulations. Because 9 out of 10 wildfires can be prevented. Brought to you by Smokey Bear, the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Learn more at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Northern Tool and Equipment. I got a uh, rather serious problem over here. All right, what are we looking at? Cranky mother-in-law asleep on the couch in the man cave. Dear God. It gets worse. That's impossible. She's passed out on the remote. I stand corrected. But what do I do? Okay, I want you to grab a torn big red hydraulic bottle jack. Uh, okay. Now you wedge that bad boy in under your mother-in-law and crank her up skyward. It's working. And the remote. Great. Now grab that torn big red two-ton folding shop crane and put that woman on wheels. And away we go. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Welcome back to After Hours AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis, right along with me. Eric Olson. And it is time for America's Most Haunted Headlines. I know we only have 15 minutes left, but please bear with us. So go on over to Twitter. Fire that bad boy up. You don't even have to be a tweeter, and you can follow along. Search out America's Most Haunted or a at am haunted and you can look at these super cool pictures and make sure you stop by america's dash most dash haunted.com that is the coolest paranormal slash awesomest amazement site on the internet 
right there. You can read all the cool articles that come along that accompany each and every show written by Mr. Eric Olson each and every week. He puts his love and soul right into those articles. So make sure you visit americas-most-honored.com. Well, thank you, Joel. Yes, absolutely, to all of that. Cutting to the chase. All right, the first one is, is I love this image. It is a very ornate kind of old-fashioned painting style. So it's very, very realistic it looks like it comes from uh you might see it up on the wall in the louvre from uh say the late 1700s it looks like a a a gallery an official uh paris gallery showing it's a tree with all kinds of weird ghostly or fairy-like entities in it Yeah, it's the harem tree it is scary and spooky as hell and there's this there's this young, uh, not not Little Red Riding Hood young, but a little bit older, carrying a basket. She's in the woods, obviously, and she's just looking up at the tree like, oh, God. Then and, again? Come yeah. on! And uh, so the caption, of course, is, she always hated that tree. <laughs> she's just not even afraid. It's just like, no, uh, it's annoying uh, at this point. Uh, yeah, these uh, people again? Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Shut I'm going to cut you down one of these days. But, but it's a great image. It's such a great image. And that's why you must go to at AM Now, Haunted. is that a picture? Is that painted? Because, man, that is a hell of a painting. It's a painting. It's wow, a painting. that is it's a great very, one. It's very a... interesting picture. Huh. It is very formal and very, very well done. I mean, it is very well done. All right, moving along. We have super scary... Frightening evil snowman with his mouth agape and his branch hand, his twig hands in the air. And he is, of course, cursing the end of winter, <laughs> which just came. It did. Angry he is. Angry. Throwing his hands to the heavens. I think I think it's a Goosebumps cover. It looks like it might be. Yeah, it might be. It looks like an angry old snowman. Get off my lawn. Yeah. All right. Well, having spent my childhood up until uh, just before I turned 14 in Southern California, we used to go to Disneyland every year and sometimes twice. And uh, my dad's company, which was TRW at the time, they the large companies out there would rent out Disneyland for their employees. Oh, very cool. So... Um, the lines are much shorter at that time, way, way back, 60s into the 70s. You, you had to use – each ride required a ticket. It oh, wasn't wow. just general admission. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so there was none of that nonsense. It was like you had free reign of the place. It was so fun. Uh, so anyway, I'm a huge, huge fan of the Haunted Mansion. That is still absolutely magical to me. And I haven't been now in maybe uh, probably 10 years or so, maybe even slightly longer than that. And that was actually in Orlando the last time I've been to any Disney facility. It was, yeah, it was about at least 10 years ago. Anyway, it was still magical. The Haunted Mansion is always, always, always. It always will be. That in space. Super mom. magical. Just love, love, love it. There, uh, I, the uh, comic book publisher, IDW, uh, has a new, and this is for like middle school age, they said it's like 8 to 12, uh, is who it's targeted at. But they have a new graphic novel set in the Haunted Mansion coming out soon. Very cool. I'll, I'll have Very to take a peek see at that because I like that Haunted Mansion. It's a lot of fun. I remember the Eddie Murphy movie. I do. Yeah. And, and in some ways, I, you know... At the time, it was really a disappointment. There, there are portions of the film that, that are very effective and are kind of scary and fun and interesting, but uh, it, it just doesn't – it's not tied in enough to the real feel of the ride. Sure, you sure. know what I mean? I, I hear what you mean. It, it was a letdown. A lot of people said that same thing. That was a letdown. Didn't have the feel of the Haunted Mansion. It like, didn't. Yeah. In a way, it's held up better, I think, than people thought it would. Because, I mean, just purely as a movie, uh, it, it's not bad. You know, it's kind of fun. It's pretty spooky. Yeah. The story's okay. Eddie Murphy's always, or usually, you know, good. He's fine. The family's good. 
Uh, it, I mean, it's a kind of an interesting story. It's just the connection to the you know Disney Haunted Mansion is tenuous at best. All righty then. So I love this next shot, another image. This is a coupon that comes from Dapper Cadaver. Remember we've had uh, that? Yeah, we did. The guy who owns that, that shop out in North Hollywood, I think, or yep. uh, maybe yep. it's Burbank. Anyway, Southern California that caters to the movie biz, but not only the movie biz, also the haunted house industry. And they just sell all kinds of props, basically, for mostly spooky, creepy, gory stuff, but not only, but a lot yeah. of Halloween really is their prime time, too. Halloween is their prime yep. time. No doubt about it. If, if it weren't for the film industry, it would be a Halloween place. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Very cool guys, though. Very interesting. Very, very cool. It. So, the, so the, the coupon, which gives you, I don't know why, 13% <laughs> Come off. Come on. Because it, it's creepy. It's very creepy. So it's, it's this woman... This uh, attractive redhead in a nightgown standing between two skeletons with her arm around one. And, and for some reason, it would, it would occur to me is it's just women. <laughs> you know, you can't live with them. Can't kill them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 13% off Dapper Cadaver. If you're interested, just go ahead and click the link. It'll get you there. All righty, the next one is a, actually a cartoon from The New Yorker, and other than around Halloween time, they're usually not really terribly re – their cartoons are, are usually kind of political or – Yeah, or satire, yeah. That oddities kind of, yeah. Of, of you know urban life, that kind of thing, new, life in New York City, that sort of thing. Uh, but this one's pretty hilarious, and it certainly is applicable. It's a picture of a man laying uh, down, apparently dead, with his hands folded – Across his chest, the Grim Reaper stands next to him, and his ghost is doing a swan dive <laughs> clearly back into his body and screaming out, Five second rule! <laughs> I thought that was pretty amusing. That, that is, that's pretty amusing right there. Pretty amusing. All right, have you heard the big, big news? It's not exactly paranormal, but they did time travel. There will be a third. Bill and Ted, excellent oh, adventure. Did we need one? I don't know that we did. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure that they left a loose ends after the bogus I, journey. I, I don't recall. And the bogus journey, journey was, um, you know, I mean, Not let's... very good. No, the first one, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, was an unhinged time-traveling classic. Was. We just watched it a little while ago. It really is hilarious. They, but they haven't necessarily aged well no they're 50 you know so yeah i, I mean yeah. these guys are 50 years old now it will be odd to hear them go dude 50s. dude Actually, yes yeah, I'm, I'm very curious what their personas will be because um you know that second film i what was that 91 i think yeah maybe it was the second one the first yeah. one was a couple years before that so i mean it really has been 30 years so these yeah. guys are in their 50s now yeah. and uh anyway this one uh uh, it's going to be made, and they're going to start shooting this summer, and yeah, Lord knows what the personas will be. I hope it is much more like the first one and much less like the Bogus Journey, which was, eh, you know, not great. I, yeah, I'm not sure if we need another one, but I will probably at least wait till it comes on Blu-ray. I will see it. I don't oh, know if it's uh, theater-worthy or not, but uh, I will so. Netflix it or Blu-ray it, one of the two. That will be coming out um, summer of 20, so check a year, year yeah. plus from now. All right, yeah. so did you check out, or were you able to see in your area, the last night's super moon? Oh, no, it was a little cloudy. I was kind of disappointed, but uh, I did hear that was going down, and I did try to look outside, especially after the show, and uh, I caught a little glimpse, and it was hell, it was really bright what I did see. Well, it's huge. That's what makes it a super yep. moon because it it is act. Excuse me again. It's actually physically closer than yes, usual. That's what makes it a super moon. Uh, it is physically closer than the normal full moon. And uh, the image here, it's just a spectacular, huge light 
yellow. I would call it a light yellow moon, and I believe yep. that was from uh, Hungary. I think it was yeah, that was hey, from you Europe. Know, in a related note, there was a super uh, there was a super moon at the Super Bowl. So hey, we got both two super moons this year. <laughs> That's and this is the last one of the year. Yes, you are right. That boy, that was a super week, wasn't it? But a, <laughs> that was a super experience. Do you know what this? You know, each full moon of the year is named something. Do you know what this one was? No, I do not. It's the worm moon. The worm moon. Huh. The worm moon. I wonder how they figured out that name. I believe it's because it's uh, the beginning of spring. So the worms are emerging from the frozen ground. Oh, yes. That's true. Yep. Coming from hibernation. Makes sense. Why not? They're worming about and whatnot. I love this next image of the Milky Way. And it's a composite, of course, because... Yeah. We don't have a camera that exists no. outside the Milky Way. No. But it's an amazing picture. It's a sideways view uh, of the Milky Way. So it's the flat. We're seeing the, the flat Milky Way. And above it and below it are these massive, unimaginably huge um, circular objects called Fermi bubbles. Wow. And they are fueled by particles supercharged particles streaming from the black hole at the center of the milky way i just hmm. find that fascinating that is very interesting interesting I mean, stuff right you there. know how big the milky way is it's huge you know? it's huge billions of stars yes that that is the milky way yep. is got a lot of things Imagine going for it. Imagine how la large these bubbles that are above and below the flat surface. Of the yep, moon. and every star Imagine is, how big they are. Every star is a sun and every sun you, you would think has its own, you know, planets surrounding it. You, well, you many know. do, we're finding out. So, yeah, think about that. Think how how crowded the universe truly is. It's it's astonishing, and the scale is what just what gets me because it's just so so mind boggling how huge it is, and just trying to the the That's relative. What she said. Well, I know <laughs> every, every time I walk in the room, yeah, <laughs> it gets old. I gotta tell you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. just, yeah, yeah. Whatever, just stop saying that. <laughs> yeah, enough. <laughs> All righty. So, guess what? We are going to have a third. Annabelle film. And again, did we need that? <laughs> Not sure, but I do agree with the assessment in this this preview of it, this write-up in iHorror, which is a pretty good site, comes from Canada, mm -hmm. um, that the second one was actually a lot better than the first one. Yes, I will, go, I will say that the second one was better than the first one. And uh, it was not bad at all. The third one, hopefully it, they, they build upon the universe... And tie it all in. I'm waiting for them to tie it all in to the original Conjuring at some point, further right. than they already have. Maybe they'll the be like the Warrens a, will be back in this one. They said okay, like maybe there'll be eventually a monster movie match a mashup where they have all the Conjuring baddies in one movie. That would be fun. That would be fun. It'd be like a Justice League. It would be. It kind of would be. Kind of like a Godzilla Godzilla versus Mothra. Or the Avengers. You just, yeah, exactly. Yes, I like that better. Now, one movie that does look good, I know you, you have it on here, it's the next tweet, is that new one from Jordan Peele. Yes, Us. And that boy, looks it did creepy. Spectacular reviews. I mean, really. And, and this review in Rolling Stone, it just came out, uh, what? Oh, I guess it officially comes out tomorrow, actually. Um, I believe. But... Uh, you know, it showed at some of the, um, I think it showed at... Film festivals and stuff. Yeah, yeah. or yep. maybe South by Southwest, or yeah. maybe it was Sundance. I don't know. Anyway, people have seen it. So um, it's uh, uh, it's getting just tremendous reviews, so much so that uh, this reviewer, anyway, Peter Travers in Rolling Stone, says that uh, Lupita Nyong'o, everyone knows she is, she's, a, she's already yep. a... Um, Academy Award winning actress, an Oscar winning actress, and she, uh, Peter Travers calls her performance perhaps the greatest in the history of horror films. No, wow, that's saying something. Cause that is saying some, something. Because, I mean, there's Silence of Lambs, there's, there's a lot of great films 
that have fallen in the horror genre that gave us some of the most iconic performances ever. Absolutely. Well, even all the way back to, you know, Boris Karloff. Yeah, um, that's saying something. Stuff, I, I hope, hopefully, the ghost scene, I, Dracula. I hope it holds up just like he said. I really do. Because that's grandiose right there. But we got to get out of here. It crept right up on us, top of the hour. We got to get out of here. We're going to be coming right back at you from the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs> Hi, Tom Bodette. If you can hear me, then you have an internet connection, which means you can do cool things online, like listen to streaming radio, obviously, or watch a video of a monkey washing a cat. Let your freak flag fly. Or you can book a room at a great price at motel6.com. Isn't the internet wonderful? Everything you want right at your fingertips and, whoa, did not need to see that. I'm Tom Bodette from Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. My student loan is totally paid off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. I paid more than the minimum each month, and soon enough, it was gone. So you're just giving up? Giving up on what? The life of luxury. Egyptian cotton, caviar Thursdays, designer everything. What are you talking about? Our plan. What happened to winning the lottery and mastering the art of the perfect mimosa? Hosting galas, wearing enough jewelry to require a bodyguard, vacationing in the French Riviera, and then buying it. I just thought maybe it was time to prepare for my future. You know, set some financial goals, make some smart investments, open a 401k. Financial goals? Investments? A 401k? You are horrifying right now. Listen, if winning the lottery were easy, everyone would do it. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Northern Tool and Equipment. So me and the boys head out to tailgate today and find some other fans in our spot. Well, it happens. Uh, cheering for the wrong team. Oh, this is war. Even worse, they've got this couch set up and everything. A couch? Yeah, it's a uh, sectional. All right, first thing, don't ever use the word sectional again. Done. Second, I want you to grab a 4,700-pound tow chain with J-hook and grab hammer. Throw that on the back of your truck. Got it. Now you're going to hail Mary the J-hook over the end of that couch. Time to find a better spot for your new friends. That should do it. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Taking a family of five to the amusement park can cost a small fortune. Oh, yeah. So to save some money, we thought, hey, let's bring the amusement park to us. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, step right up. Step right up, young man. Are you ready to ride the Wacky Waterfall? That's just the bathtub with the shower head running. Nope, it's the Wacky Waterfall. It's the shower, Dad. Waterfall. Wacky. There's an easier way to save. To get a free rate quote, go to Geico.com. Then buy online, over the phone, or at your local Geico office. Green light. Hey, girl. School zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> It's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. And welcome back to After Hours AM, everybody. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis, right along with me. Eric Olson. And Eric, we have a good friend back on, and from a cool museum, the Buckland, like the coolest museum ever, but I will step aside and let you do what you do best, my friend. Ooh, we're going we're gonna to do it again. We're going to run through that whole explanation and bio. We're going to do every word, by golly. And you're going to like it. And everyone is going to revel. You're going to revel in it, my friends. All right. We are talking about the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, Cleveland's 
Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, recently featured on Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum, is reopening tomorrow. How is that for timing? March 22nd, 2019, which is, by the way, my father's birthday. How odd is that? At a new expanded location with room for all kinds of amazemo artifacts from the collection of one of the founders of Wicca in the 20th century, Raymond Buckland, along with contributions from many other luminaries of the craft and contextual popular culture items assembled to display the tools and imagery of witchcraft and magic while celebrating the First Amendment and the power of outsider art. Raymond Buckland started the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic way back in 1966 after visiting the late Gerald Gardner and his collection on the Isle of Man. That's a magical place. Raymond was inspired to start a collection of his own. While working for British Airways, he was able to acquire many of the artifacts in this collection from all around the world. He initially displayed his museum on a few shelves in the basement of his Long Island, New York home. However, over time, Raymond's witchcraft collection grew to well over 500 artifacts, ranging from ancient Egyptian Ush. Ushabtis, Ushabtis, to documented artifacts from the Salem witch trials. This was the first museum of its kind in the United States with an anthropological approach to the world of folklore and the supernatural. I lied. I am not going to put you through the history of the museum <laughs> between Raymond in the 60s and uh, where we are now. Suffice it to say, Raymond ran it for a while. It got bigger. Then he had to go do other things. So he Put it away. Then he, someone else got it. It appeared, it reappeared in diminished form in New Orleans in 1999, just popping up in 1999, and eventually working its way to Ohio in 2015. And magically, it is reopening tomorrow, as we said, March 22nd, in expanded form at 2155 Broadview Road in the old Brooklyn neighborhood of Cleveland. It's the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Features The collection features artifacts from dozens of people, but including Raymond himself, Gerald Gardner, Lady Rowan, or is it Rowan, Alistair Crowley, Sybil Leake, Anton LaVey. Those are some big names. Those are some heavy hitters. Those are some witches, man. And many, many other leaders of the pagan community. We are speaking with the director and I, I imagine owner, Stephen Intermill, his wife, Jillian, who was with us last time, is not with us this evening, but she is here in spirit. Stephen is the curator and director of the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft. Uh, wait, yes, Museum of Witchcraft uh, and Magic, and has long been fascinated by the history of the American occult, an interest he's been studying for well over 30 years. His favorite thing about the museum is the ability to get lost in Raymond Buckland's archives, the collection of letters, receipts, and general media gives an incredible glimpse into the modern occult scene and revival. And much of that is what will be on display now in the larger quarters. Welcome to the program, Stephen Intermill. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Hey, Stephen. Like always, great talking with you and glad you're back. You know, I don't think we asked this last time. Maybe we did, but we're going to refresh everyone. How did you come in possession of this vast, well, museum, all the great stuff? All right. Well, and there lies the story. I was bored at work one day. I was the curator of a very popular Cleveland destination. It's a, uh, it was a museum dedicated, well, it's still a museum dedicated to the film A Christmas Story. And I was at work one day, I was just kind of bored, and I was like, you know what? I think I'd rather be the curator of a witchcraft museum. <laughs> <laughs> just out of nowhere. The yin to the yang. So I just, uh, I Google witchcraft museum, and I come across Raymond Buckland's, and I worked at Walden Books for a couple years in the 90s, so I knew Big Blue really well, and I was like... That's uh, his book, The Complete Book of Witchcraft, which is Raymond Buck Buckland's uh, magnum opus on witchcraft. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he had a witchcraft museum. So I send him an email. He forwards the email to a woman named Tony, who's the actual owner of the collection. She calls me up. She's like, hey, I heard that you want to see the uh, museum. Well, it's all in boxes. But, yeah, why don't you come down to Columbus? I did. Um, Tony's really cool um i said 
hey, how about I bring my wife down here? She'd like to see it. She does. And Jill's just like, yeah, okay, sure. Let's do it. And uh, we opened up in a record store. My friend had a very small space. And I was like, you know what you could uh, put in here? Some witchcraft music. (laughs) (laughs) By the way, it would go along great with your Beatles albums. It's some witchcraft. And uh, he's just like, yeah, but where are you going to get one of those? I'm like, well, I, I know a lady. So uh, I was like, hey, Tony, what do you say? We open it up here in this museum in uh, in uh, Tremont. And we did. And that turned out really well. So we doubled because it was just a small room at first because I really just wanted to work on a catalog. Yeah. And I thought, Nobody's going to come see this thing. I'll have all this time to just go through the artifacts, go through the archive. But. Luckily, people just kept knocking at the door. Hey, I want to see the Witchcraft Museum. Hey, I want to see the Witchcraft Museum. So we're like, huh, guess we actually have to serve this thing. So we doubled in size after a few months. and But within seconds of doubling, we're like, we're going to need more space than this. And that's uh, what brought us here today. Well, that's that's a great story. I mean, just it, you fell into it. And you first you had an idea and you pursued it. And were you shocked, though, when things fell the way they did, where you actually became in possession of this entire catalog of of the cult, this museum? Well, you know, it's just funny because it's, uh, you know, sometimes I like to kind of step outside of myself a little bit and kind of look, and it all just kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... uh, it's obviously something that I'd been working on for years and years, but um, it's uh, some things are meant to be. Yeah, yeah, they really are. I mean, it was your density, my friend. Yeah, well, nowadays you can't swing a dead cat without hearing about someone's haunted collection. But you guys did it first, and you guys have done it best, and that yeah. and that's what makes you guys stand out. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, I. I Kudos to everybody with their haunted objects and stuff. Um, but I, I, one thing I'm afraid is people that uh, start collecting that stuff for a novelty kind of thing mm-hmm. that aren't necessarily um, prepared for the psychic toll that a lot of this stuff can take on you. What do you mean by that, the psychic toll? I mean, is there a downside? I mean, there's a downside of everything, I think. Sure. And uh, I think... Ooh, that was profound. Yeah, there was. Well, yeah, there was. Yeah, he's, he's right. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of game players out there. A lot of people are just like, hey, you, uh, for example, we have a very notorious demon in a box. Mm-hmm. And Russell Buckland captured this thing in the late 60s, early 70s in the, long, uh, in the uh, Lower East Side of New York. I like to think it's over there um, on St. Mark's where they uh, took the photo for physical graffiti, but it's probably not. But um, I digress. Uh, so we have this demon in a box, and just every day, all day long, it's people saying, well, I'd open it. And, you know, really? That's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's rather cavalier. Yeah. yeah it, that's exactly how I describe it. It's just like, oh. You're feeling pretty bold. <laughs> yeah. uh, I so, mean, there's a, in third grade, you hear the story about Pandora. Exactly. Exactly. Or the Divic box. Don't you know, open the box. You, think, you, know, you never open the box that's never been opened before. You don't want to be that guy to open no. the box. No, you don't. And, uh, you know, I hope people think about that sort of thing. Well, sure, and and you said the psychic toll. I would imagine that your your museum has got to be haunted to beat the band, man. <laughs> it's uh, there's definitely some things attached, um, and uh, there's some things that I think are just completely like, just there's nothing, and then there's some things that are just seeped with something. No, have you ever considered opening uh, opening up the museum to like a, a, a reputable ghost investigation team? Uh, not really, because first and foremost, this is a uh, collection of artifacts of articles of faith. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, I, I really don't need people buzzing around with their devices and stuff. That's true. I, I get it, but it's also like, eh, I mean, there's people that want to. Uh, I mean, there's people that want to do DNA tests on the Shroud of Torin, you know. And it's, uh, I mean, come on. Yeah. Keep the mystery alive. I agree with you. My, we were talking about that last night, Joel, weren't we? we were talking about, I mean, pe- do people really want the Jack the Ripper mystery to be solved? No. Um, no, they don't. I don't. I don't think they do. I think it's not the prince, it's nobody. It, well, sure, exactly. <laughs> You know, it's it's got to be, and and that was uh, part of what we were talking about because the the now apparent seeming answer is so much more prosaic and so much more boring and lame, and we don't need to know that. I, I'm closing my ears. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I what what I have picked up on slowly but surely about you because you don't really push this side of it forth is that I think you are mentally and psychically prepared to be the guy who does run this place because you do have a respect uh, obviously an interest of course but you have a respect for this tradition and for what it represents and i think if someone really was trying to run the place you know just purely from a pt barnum kind of Way yeah, out. it's barn or just a money making proposition, or 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 just from a, a, the artifact uh, as art, that kind of thing. I don't think that would be the right person to run the place, and I think you'd probably have a lot more trouble with um, entities being unhappy if it wasn't run by people who are respectful and who, uh, you know, don't shake the box, as it were. Can can you tell us a little bit about? Well, does that make sense to you? Does that apply, or or, or am I reading too much into it? No, that's uh, that's completely on point. It's you know I I think that's uh, our modus operandi. It's just uh, I want people to come in and uh, kind of get a, have a chance to reflect a bit on mm-hmm. their. Uh, their non-traditional spiritual side. Sure. Well, and plus, you offer, uh, as a side benefit, a whole lot of history. Yeah. I mean, you got stuff there, artifacts from the Salem Witch Trial. You got just things that are meaningful just to the history of humans. I mean, what we've gone through yeah. in that regard as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's... um. You know, like, there's so many different angles that you could take with this stuff. And I guess my interest isn't necessarily uh, letting one angle become, you know, the overriding one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, just a little something for everyone. And and that's what makes it so much fun. I mean, Eric, you'd gone there now, and and you perused everything we talked about link before we had uh steven on the first time and, and you had a hell of a good time over there and, and it was just also fun to watch people's reaction as a people watcher yes absolutely it, it is it, and uh, i'm really excited to see the new place which i have not yet seen and see the expanded collection there that was something we really wanted to get to steven our or what is new? If someone has been to the old location but is 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 eager, is dying to get to the new location, what will they find there that they did not see before? All right. Well, first thing right off the bat, we have a piece that my father, um, I guess I reclaimed for paganism for my dad. My father <laughs> is an industrialist, and he was working in Sweden in the mid-'70s. And he was blowing apart this mountain, and he, uh, everybody in management got these sacrificing bowls that were these Neolithic sacrificing bowls. You would put uh, fruits, berries, maybe some meat, maybe some blood in it, and overnight the, uh, the, the gods would come and consume them, Okay. Maybe it was deer, maybe it was elk, maybe it was bird. <laughs> but, you know, the idea is yeah. uh, these sacrificing bulls. And every member of management 
at his work got one of these things. And, you know, I've been staring at this thing since I was like four years old. And it just didn't seem right. And I'm, and I just remember when I was a kid, just seeing the uh, gross commercialism that's going on here. And so I just recently reclaimed that for the pagans. So that's one of the first things that you see when you go on your tour here. <laughs> and uh, that's promptly on display. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? We have a large collection of ephemera. Just... Um, just uh, business cards, um, flyers, just that kind of stuff that's been collected over the years. Uh, business cards from psychic readers that Buckland knew in the 60s. Uh, Raymond Buckland's business cards from back then. Uh, that That is the stuff that I really find the most joy going through. Because it's just, uh, it really... Um, I guess when I first started going through that stuff, every business card of every psychic reader or uh, astrologer, etc., I'd be like, this is a real person that went out there and was just like, I'm going for it. I'm yeah. Gonna, <laughs> you know, and it's uh, that to me, that just flushes this stuff out so much more to know that, you know, you read about like kind of like the pagans, the or, uh, you know, like the early leaders of the movement, you know, but there were a lot of other people that were part of it too. Just essentially footnotes in this like metaphysical history. And, uh, it's kind of like giving life to them a bit. Sure. I mean, again, it's history. It's the history of a uh, Raymond Buckland. I mean, to see his correspondence to people, what they sent him and, what was was he? What was Raymond like? I know you knew him in life. What, what was he like? Uh, very understated, funny. Uh, probably most of all, he was just a really uh, sweet and funny guy. Very charming. Very uh, considerate. You know, I tell a story where right when we first opened up, I was a bit overwhelmed, and I email him and say something like. Uh, hey, Ray, somebody wants a press release about this. Uh, this is kind of what I got. What do you think? And I get an email back saying, well, Stephen, I'm very busy. Um, you know, it can't wait. And I'd say, oh, sure. And then like 20 minutes later, the whole thing would be rewritten. And, you know, like the stuff in the middle would be at the top, you know, and he'd have a little note saying, you got to stick with the most important stuff. Like, all right, you know, so he was very generous with his time. Uh, people always come in here and they tell me, you know, like, yeah, I emailed Raymond Buckland one time. And I got this lengthy response back from him telling me that, you know, like, so uh, he was just a really sweet, generous person that was very um, just open to people. Yeah, he sounds like he would have been a wonderful mentor. Plus, you know, he was just very funny, which... Yeah. Uh, I think I really love it's uh, just when you I have some of the manuscripts for his stuff and his uh, uh, not sure how to just the his take on things were very light hearted for a person who was bringing a religion to the United States, you know, mm -hmm. things like. Hey, you know, if you're in the ritual and you accidentally step on the candle, don't worry about it, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, so many people, I meet so many people, and, like, every religion has the people that are uptight about stuff, mm -hmm. you know? It's, uh, you know, you read about, like, the Buddhists in Burma, and you're like, whoa, dude. It's, uh, you, he, he wasn't a fundamentalist, I guess. He was just somebody that... Um, well, he was a humanist, it yeah, sounds like. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I think it's easy to forget he was the guy that brought paganism to the mainstream in America. You yeah. Know, you know, he, he was the guy. He was definitely involved. And uh, it's uh, – I recently I've started going through um, – yeah, if your followers want to follow our Instagram, it's Buckland Museum, and you'll see a lot of the stuff that I uncover in the archives there. 
And recently I've been going to the Cleveland Public Library because they have an incredible scanning bed that's oversized so I can scan these newspaper articles. And, uh, you know, he was out there, like, in these newspaper articles in the late 60s, early 70s, doing his thing, you know, like, doing his hustle. But there there are, like, some other people there. There's one guy. And if any of your listeners know about this guy, please get a hold of me because uh, his name's Herbert Sloan. He was the first American Satanist. Everybody thinks it's Anton LaVey, but this guy supposedly started his own Satanic Church in um, 1948 in Toledo, and uh, he was a <laughs> partner, and uh, he just wrote a bunch of fan letters to Buckland that are completely amazing. They're just this guy was going for it out in Toledo, and um, yeah, just yeah, he, he pinned his ears back and just went for the gusto and created his own church, Satanist church. Yeah. Yeah, wow. the uh, the first tr- the uh, first church of Endor, actually, Ooh. like as in <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, I uh, know Star Wars. Star Wars, the planet Endor. Interesting. <laughs> well, there's that, but it's also the Witch of Endor in the Bible, where uh, uh, yes, I, oh yeah, that thing, the Bible. Yeah, yeah. that that old rag. Yeah. yeah, some guy goes in there, goes to see her. He's like. Uh, it was some king, I can't remember which one, but all his people are like, you can't go see the witch. And he's like, yeah, I won't go see that witch. And then when nobody's looking, he goes to see the witch. And she's just like, what are you doing? It's, uh, it's like one of the good stories in the Bible, because the witch is one of the good stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is full of some mundane stories, too. But yeah, no, I, I do... You know, I, I do remember hearing about that story in there. That and the resurrection are a couple neck and neck. It was Saul is yeah, the one who visited the witch of Endor because he wanted to summon the spirit of Prophet Samuel. All right, so there was somebody at the door, and I got very nervous, and it was Jillian coming Hello? in from our event at the Natural History Museum. Hi, Jillian. Hey, Jillian, how you doing? <laughs> yes, how are you? We are live on radio, so welcome aboard. We are rocking it. All right, so I remember, I do recall this, Stephen, that Raymond Buckland, who who passed fairly recently, how long ago was it? About a year and a half ago. Yeah, it's weird. It's very similar to uh, I remember this from uh, to my dad. Mm-hmm. Now you said you had some sort of feeling or experience right around that time, yeah. if, I, if I recall. Why don't you relate that to us? Because uh, it certainly shows a link between you. Well, um, so the first thing that happened, this was very weird, is right around the time Raymond Buckland passed, I was going through the archives a bit, and I found a letter that he wrote to Playboy magazine where he's complaining. He's just like, hey, you guys wrote this article about Wicca. It's completely outrageous. It's not based in fact. Here's a rebuttal. Here's a response. You should publish this. And I'm reading this letter back from Playboy that's like, yeah, no, we're good. Um, (laughs) And and right at that moment would have been around the time both both Hugh Hefner and Raymond Buckland passed away. Oh, wow. Like, passed away on the same day, in the evening, around the same time. And a lot of people are like, hey, do you think they had a cool conversation on the way up to the Pearly Gates? And I'm like, <laughs> hey, I don't think you were really paying attention, but okay, sure. <laughs> so that was the first weird psychic thing that happened. But I'm, right after Buck passed, of course, you know, I'm processing it in my head. And I had this really beautiful dream where um, I helped his friend Bill Martino. Uh, Bill and I moved Buck's experimental airplane out of the garage, and uh, he fires it up, and then he says, well, you know, I have to go inside to say uh, goodbye to Tara, his his widow. So he takes her out, gives her a kiss, kind of throws the uh, scarf over his shoulder, puts on the uh, the goggles, gets in the plane, flies away. And uh, right beforehand, he's like, yeah, I'll see you later. Takes off. Wow. Oh, 
very, very dramatic, very, very cinematic. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Is, is he, that... he he definitely lived larger than life, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was a neat guy. And like one thing that you you know you always forget about people is uh, you know they you know them for one thing, but there's all this other stuff that goes around, right? Like sure. for example, Raymond Buckland was a uh, he was into experimental airplanes. He was into comedy. He uh, became a stand-up comic in the last couple of years of his life. Uh, I mentioned Bill Martino. That was one of his best pals down in Holmes County. And Bill worked for the local library associate or uh, library and uh, library system. And Bill and Ray came up with this idea, like, let's have a comedy fundraiser. So every six months, Buck would go up on a stage and tell some kind of body jokes. And uh, that was... We uh, actually went one time. That was pretty neat. That's when he gave us the demon in the box, actually. Oh, wow. I mean, how oh. do you receive a demon in the box, though? What yeah. do you say? Thanks. Now we have to talk about y- that. Yeah, yeah. How did that... Yeah. What was your reaction when he handed you a box and said, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a demon that lives in there? So don't open it. Uh, yeah, I took a selfie with it. Jill thought that was annoying. Um, we took We took it home. And then uh, she's like, okay, this stays in the house one night. And I'm like, all right. So I took it uh, to a location off-site. And it's kind of a weird little thing. It um, definitely has some vibes. People faint around it. That's always kind of awkward. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, they find themselves on the floor. Yeah, because, I mean... I had a, uh, I had like a team building thing here where uh, people from a popular uh, corporate uh, insurance company that's very popular around here locally, they came in, some execs did, and I asked them, I'm like, hey, what kind of insurance should I carry on this? And they're like, oh, you should just go with Hartford of Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. You mean not progressive? <laughs> You're right, exactly. <laughs> progressive, we're like, eh, no. Yeah, we don't, don't cover call demons. Flo on that one. Yeah, yeah, we really don't. We're not in the don't business. Don't even call Jamie. No, don't even... no, don't even do that. Hey, we got to run a break. We come back. We're going to be talking more with Stephen Intermill about the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs> Northern Tool and Equipment. So Daddy's little girl thinks she's going to prom tonight with some punk who calls himself Snake. Yeah, they grow up so fast. Well, not if I can help it, they don't. Okay, here's what you do. When that kid shows up, Dad's going to be doing a few chores around the house. Huh? It doesn't matter the chore. What's important is that it requires the use of a 60cc gas-powered chainsaw and possibly a mask. I think it's showtime. He's here. Dad, I want you to meet... All right, let her rip. What's that, honey? Uh, Oh, hi, Snake. Great to meet you. But wait, where are you going? There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Ranger Station, Ranger speaking. Yeah, hi. I'd like to report a bear sighting. Location. My backyard. Oh, your backyard. Try telling a bear that. I did, and this bear talked back. Talking bear, that's rich. No, wait, it was Smokey Bear. Smokey? Why didn't you say so? I did say so. Continue. I was burning yard waste. No, boy. He told me to burn legally and responsibly, and to remember that if it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. And as always, he's right. You know, 9 out of 10 wildfires are caused by humans. That means 9 out of 10 wildfires can be prevented. Yeah, I know that now. Thanks to me. Actually, thanks to Smokey. As usual, the talking bear gets all the credit. Get your Smokey on. Always burn responsibly and contact your local fire department for open burning regulations. Because 9 out of 10 wildfires can be prevented. Brought to you by Smokey Bear, the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Learn more at SmokeyBear.com. Only you can prevent wildfires. Uh, 
And welcome back to After Hours AM, everybody. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis, right along with me. Eric Olson. And tonight we're talking with Stephen Intermill, and he is the curator and owner and all things that makes the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic go. And so they got a great new location. They're expanding. We had them on, oh, I would say about five, six months ago. And since then, lots of changes have happened. When we were leaving, we were talking about the infamous demon in the box. Every For time those I, who haven't, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go, I was going to say, ahead. every time I hear about Demon in the Box, I think about Justin Timberlake, but it's a whole other unrelated story. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. For those who, who didn't hear the last show, please do tell us the, the background of the box. How, how did the demon come to be in the box? And what experiences have you had at the museum? And I'm very curious, has, have you felt that all these vibes move over to the new location? You know, that's the thing. I'll, all right, so the box comes. Here's the tale. Is Raymond Buckland one day gets a phone call from a friend of his, and uh, his friend's a ceremonial magician named Tom who lives in the Lower East Side of New York. And Tom's like, hey, Buck, what are you doing Saturday? You want to hang out, watch this game? Buck was a very sociable person, so he's like, yeah, sure. So he takes the Long Island Railroad down from uh, – from Brentwood, Long Island, goes to this guy's place, and his friend closes the door, and he's essentially like, yeah, man, so, um, yeah, there's another reason why I called you here. I conjured something, and I can't get rid of it. <laughs> no, well, no. So, you know, like, hey, man, not my demon, not my problem, that kind of thing. And his friend's like, no, seriously, I, I really need your help. I've lost my job. I've lost my up. Uh, my wife's left, left me. I'm about to lose my apartment. And uh, Buck's like, oh, no, not your apartment. So, uh, <laughs> like, all right. I'll... Anything but that. So he goes back home and he gets a collection of grimoires that he had just purchased. And he brings them down and they get to work. And he said that it was a really intense couple days. But when they were convinced that this demon was inside of this box, they sealed it with incantations and a little bit of a framing wire just so the lid doesn't pop open. And he takes it home, <laughs> puts it on a shelf as a trophy for the time they fought the demon. So I, you know, like, honestly, at first I was just like, wink, wink, demon in a box, you know. Sure. But there's been a lot of weird stuff that surrounds that thing. Um, I mentioned earlier people fainting. Um, there's been some acts of aggression dealing with it. We actually had to get a uh, like a professional museum case that uh, needs special tools to get into because of people trying to break into it. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of weird stuff around it. So, you know, like... Uh, you get people in, they're psychics, and they just like they don't. They've never been to the location before, and they just kind of like, kind of wave over there, and they're like, "What the hell is going on over there?" And you're like, "Well, that's where the demon lives. That's where he lives. It's his lair." Like, yeah, totally checks out. So you know, like just stuff like that just adds up to uh, the fact that we're not going to open the damn thing. So there's people that come into the museum in the past that will attempt to open, take matters in their own hands to open the box? Uh, well, there was a gentleman one time. It was a Friday night. Jillian had just left, and it was just me. And this guy barges in, and he's like, yeah, I was driving by, and something said, hey, go into that place. So here I am. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, let's <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Then, he just kind of barges past me, and he goes into the cat, goes to the cabinet that the box was in, and he's trying to like pry it open with his fingernails. And I'm like, "Hey, um, I'm gonna call the cops." And uh, we had this exchange, and eventually, I just kind of like pushed him out the door. And that that was my first clue <laughs> that uh, this thing's got some legs so do you guys have a big billboard that says demon in a box located here or something how'd the guy know that no, there was a demon I, in the I, box i don't know dude's just driving down it's strange 
I just remember I remember him screaming at me like it wants to be friends and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> I think you're catching the wrong signals. You know? Why can't we be friends? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got his low rider driving around. <laughs> Hey, um, there was this really incredible bookstore called the Old Erie Street Bookstore in Cleveland. And I was helping Mark Stevie, the owner, move out of it. And it was uh, it was kind of weird because Raymond Buckland had a drawing of the demon. And uh, Mark, he just said, hey, yeah, I found this in the back. I think you'd like it. And it was a, you know, like a Elvis painting, like a velvet painting. Yeah, it was like that, except it had a stylized version of the demon on it. On the uh, instead of um, this demon's like sitting on a toilet smoking a cigarette, but it's the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me you have oh, that yeah. hanging next to the demon box. Come on, yeah, no, it's actually in my bathroom. But <laughs> Mark was like, he's like, yeah, I thought you'd like this, and I'm like, oh, Mark, I got this demon trapped in a box at my museum and he's like oh steven i always knew that you'd grow up to do great things <laughs> <laughs> didn't you say now that you we, you've mentioned something about the name which i guess we're not going to say but what what has happened when people have uttered the name in the presence had, had, hasn't there been some sort of reaction yeah there's all sorts of weird stuff that happens when people mutter it um uh one person's like one of their limbs like went cold. Um, it's called a see. stroke. I <laughs> hate that. It yeah. was actually the I I checked and it was the right arm and I was like, okay, cool. Um, it was it was just kind of like, yeah, it gets aggressive. It pushes back because when you when you're a demonologist, when you're uh, trying to control demons, and you got the name. Uh, essentially poking the bear yeah you know yeah he's trapped in there and he's just like yeah yeah i know yeah well what else in there is of questionable origins and things like that Uh, aside from the demon in the box i mean clearly Uh, there's gotta be lots more interesting items that are kind of make you go wow that's strange probably the darkest energy piece that we have in there is an affame an affame is a ritual dagger used by Wiccans to, um, it's, it's just like a ceremonial piece. And there's an affame that nobody knows where it came from, but every psychic that we've ever put in front of it, it's just like, oh yeah, this is bad vibes. So, um, not really sure what the tale, like, what's the deal with that? We, uh, we have something that Eric, I think you'll love these. We have, uh, these don't have any dark vibes to them at all, but we have, uh, you know, the Fillmore West, Fillmore East, the concert posters. The Oh, yes. Presents. Well, we have a large collection of postcards that were uh, sent to Buckland at the Witchcraft Museum of these cards. So we have them displayed in a section I like to call our uh, 6660s area. Our Anton LaVey stuff and uh, some uh, Pro Arts posters. If you remember Pro Arts, they're the ones that did the uh, Farrah Fawcett poster. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, what do you. No. Some incredible headshot posters, too. Beans, you brought up the name Anton LaVey. What's your take on him? Do you you believe he was the wickedest man ever? Or do you believe he was a spy for the British government? Uh, that would be Alistair Crowley. Oh, I'm sorry uh, about that. I, my mistake, Alistair Crowley, by the way. But uh, Crowley, I think, was probably just probably a neat guy. I don't know if I would have been able to hang out with him. I think he probably would have made fun of me a lot. Um, <laughs> Anton LaVey, I think, is a pretty interesting case because he's, you know, I mean, he's like American occultism. Yeah, he's like the rock and roller of uh, of Satanism. Of yeah, the, uh, you know that kind of that church, that church of Satan, right? Define occultism, so for people. I don't know, Eric. What do you say? It's uh, exploring things that are hidden. I guess would be like the dictionary definition. 
otherwise i don't really know it's so broad it's so vast mm -hmm. you know it's uh um i remember sylvester stallone's mom was reading people's butts like <laughs> now that is a cult yeah it was like uh yeah you know it's uh it, i mean talk about what's hidden right um <laughs> A cult means hidden, so it's... It uh, does. That is the literal meaning. Yes, you... you I guess it's correct. just like exploring things that most people are mm -hmm. like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. Yeah. Man, fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, whenever I hear a cult, I don't, I don't think about hidden. I think about Anton LaVey and, and other individuals. Uh, Jim Jones, that was a cult. No, it wasn't. That was Christian. He was a minister. Yeah, he was a cult. Come on, that was a cult. Yeah. When you it drink was... Kool-Aid and murder people for, you know, telling on your cult, that's a cult. Uh, well, that, I mean, there's just such a huge difference between cults and a cult, though. You know? It's, yeah, uh... Yes, there is a huge difference. A cult and a cult are completely two different things. Interesting yeah. uh, similarities, though, from an uh, entomological perspective that cult is a part of a cult but yes as to as to the reality of that what is your sense since you're obviously you know not just surface red but you you really know this stuff what is your sense as to the actual efficacy the power is there actual power in occult knowledge or or in witchcraft itself are, are there things that can be achieved through those means that cannot be achieved through other means. Yeah, sure. I uh, I always think about this guy, Juan Milo Duquette, and he is a writer on, uh, like, he wrote a book that kind of explains the Kabbalah really well. He's a general mystic. He's involved with the Ordo Templar Orientis, which is Aleister Crowley's cult. Um, he... Uh, he says, it's all in your head. You just have no idea how large your head is. Um, <laughs> Got it. And I think, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think with occultism, there's certain ways to tap into certain parts of your brain mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like firing on all pistons. Sure. Sure. I think that might be the key to a lot of this. Mm-hmm. And looking deeper into things and not just look, you know, at the surface. Exactly. So would it be tied in to things like meditation, uh, you know, yoga? I mean, I know that's a that's kind of a joke. There was some, I don't know, some fundamentalist was ranting and raving that, that uh, you know, yoga is, is, is satanic and demonic and all this kind of thing. But from a uh, non-hysterical perspective, are these kind of different approaches to get to the same place yes absolutely you know it's uh when you have uh, uh yeah i mean there these are time tested techniques that have been going on for for thousands of years of people like optimizing their brains and um you know like optimizing their energy flows Gotcha, gotcha. It's it, it's a uh, again. It's all all comes back to really spirituality, spiritualism. I mean, at its heart, all these things are are, are a leap of faith and spiritual. It's just a different realm of spirituality. Yeah. So uh, your take on you know what a witchcraft and and magic with a CK museum would be uh, also includes a lot of popular culture artifacts that do that give it context plus you're also I assume you'll continue to also be a bookstore and um, you know museum kind of gift shop type thing what is your sense you know wh why did you go so full so deep into the pop culture side of it why do you think it's important to provide that context for the actual magical items for for the magical artifacts, why do you want that perspective? 
Well, because, I mean, think about it. It's uh, pop culture is what brings people in to the occult, be it, like, Dungeons and Dragons to, uh, you know, Ronnie James Dio record albums. It's uh, popular culture is essentially the guiding light out there that's just like, hey, check this out. I, uh, and, um, you know, pop culture is, uh, I mean, it's kind of like the religion of America. And uh, it's Mm. it's what really drives people to uh, studying this stuff in the first place. Sure. I I, I agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. That's what brings you to the tables, the pop culture. And then you look deeper into it. I mean, you know, every year on uh, Memorial Day weekend, we have a big uh, garage sale like up and down my street. And I always put the Ouija boards out because people come out and, you know, the kids buy them and then their moms make them return them. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. (laughs) Because, you know, people just walk by and they start screaming. And they're like, you know, everybody's got a Ouija board story to tell. And, uh, you know, they're screaming and people are like, oh, what's going on over there? So, you know, it's just develops a bigger crowd for everything else sure nothing brings them in like a good ouija board it's a lost leader it really is it is come for the board but buy the shirts yes exactly on on the um literary side of things tell us about the width and breadth of the books that you have for sale there because uh it was it was very not a huge volume, but a very, very granular approach to, to this world. Pretty much anything you'd want to find. Um, so is that going to continue? Are you expanding? And what, what, are, what are the parameters? What, what books do you stock? Uh, I stock pretty much any kind of book that I'm interested in. So, I, you know, coming up when I did... I think my favorite books ever were probably like uh, the early Feral House books, stuff like uh, research books, if you remember those, like the Industrial Culture Handbook. Oh, yeah. yeah. So just, you know, I, uh, I guess my heart's with the 90s fringe. But then we also have like large collections of, uh, you know, of course we have a large collection of Wiccan books. We have a lot of stuff on ceremonial magic. We have all sorts of stuff on uh, just general uh, broad spirits, uh, spiritism. Uh, we have a lot of stuff on, um, uh, let's see, we have a pretty robust tarot section right now. So anything that you would think that would be in our bookstore, we either have or have had or will have. <laughs> that's a good answer. That's a broad. Uh, that's a that's a response to that. What what should people who have been there and who are familiar? And I know you. Uh, there's a lot of people who come in pretty often, and I know you have a lot of. You, you basically have a community really built around the museum. What do you think they're going to think in terms of the new place? What what are they going to notice? What's 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 your built in crowd? How are they going to respond? What are they going to notice? What's going to feel different to them? Uh, well, first, they're going to be stoked that they're not just, like, crammed on top of each other. <laughs> you know? it's uh, We've got some breathing room now. And I think that's, uh, uh, you know, that was the one thing that I always didn't like about the other spot is, you know, you get more than, like, two people in, and it felt like people were just, like, in a cage match. And now, you know, you, there's there's room for some, like, contemplation of, metaf- uh, like, meditation with the artifacts themselves so sure get the get that room to walk around and and really appreciate it without bumping into somebody directly yeah and i think that's uh that's gonna wind up being like the greatest part of all of this is just um people actually get a chance to like uh vibe with the artifacts themselves You've you've been doing lots of events at the museum. Do you have any planned for yet for the new location? Uh, we're hoping to have a Beltane of uh, Alpergus Noct party somewhere around uh, probably the twenty sixth of April. It'll be kind of our two year anniversary party. Uh, Rosemary Guiley, I think, is going to give a, a lecture, a 
workshop on uh, Black Mirrors on May 9th. Um, there's a woman that was in the film, the uh, Cult Experience, the Neville Drury film, uh, the documentary from the uh, early 80s. She's from Australia. She's going to come present uh, in June. Let's see what else we got. Oh, The Mummy and the Monkey, America's greatest uh, horror host duo. Ones, they're going to be here. I um, think they're going to come probably around Beltane, too, for a, like, six months to Halloween party. Uh, so, yeah, we got a lot of stuff planned. We got a lot more. Shannon Taggart, the spiritualist photographer, I was just talking to her recently about showing off some of her uh, spiritualism photos. There was a guy here in Cleveland, Jake Griswold. He went down to Veracruz and took some photos of a really incredible uh, Mexican witch cult. And we're going to have some, uh, we're going to show some of his video from that in photos. So, yeah, a lot of stuff going on, which is just the whole reason why we wanted to open up in, like, much larger space. So. Sounds very, very cool. When is the soft opening for the exhibit? Uh, if you show up here tomorrow at noon, I'll let you in. Very cool. Tomorrow <laughs> at noon, you just go up there, rap on the door, and say, hey, I heard yeah. on the radio that you're going to be, you know, let people in. And, yes. And, and by the way, where's your bathroom and the demon in the box? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a story with that bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> or there will be. All right, well, yeah, why don't right? you give... How can people get a hold of you? Uh, you know, website, social media. Why don't you give us the location, the address okay. once again, and all of that good contact info. Let's see. We have BucklandMuseum.org, which I actually have to update as soon as I get off the phone here. Uh, we have the Facebook page, which uh, if you just put into the little browser part, Buckland Museum of Witchcraft, you'll find us. Let's see. Uh, we have an Instagram Buckland uh, Museum, and uh, Kai asked me today if we had a Twitter, and I think we do, but I never use it. So there's one tweet. <laughs> one, I found one, one tweet. There is one single tweet. Yeah, so that's uh, there's all the usual ways. Of course, there's Buckland Museum at gmail dot com. If you just want to uh, send me a message, say what's up. Sure. Oh, and any lastly, swag? Oh, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. I say any any T-shirts you can buy, and also if people are inclined, uh, how do you support yourselves through donations? Because I see a donation button on the website. Are you open to donations as well? Yeah, of course. But most of all, I like to collect admission from people because we get a nice little admission tax for the city of Cleveland when we do that. So you know, we're helping the locals. Sure. But um, yeah, come in, buy some crystals. I got a lot of them. Very cool. Sounds like a great place. Sounds very uh, interesting. I have yet to get there. I know, Eric, you're probably going to go back. Go back tomorrow at noon, Eric, and, and test the theory of the soft opening. <laughs> I, I, the soft white underbelly. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Give it a uh, try. I am very excited to, to check it out and uh, probably wait till the weather's slightly better, but it'll be lots of fun. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't work this weekend anyway. We we got some stuff going on. But uh, we, we we have my mother's service, and then we have a band gig Saturday night. Uh, we're preparing for all that tomorrow. But, uh, yes, in the very near future, we are going to stop in and see what's going on and uh, bring the kids and the pets and have a gala fun time. Yeah, they really – Stephen may be a little bit um, modest, but they – They've really made themselves, you know, real important fixture in the, in the Cleveland uh, social c cultural scene. They really have. Very cool. Oh, that's really sweet. That's that's great to hear. And also, you know, again, it's history. You're also helping preserve this history that otherwise would have been lost or just sitting in a box in someone's storage bin. Yeah, but, that's... you know, it's out and about, and we all can enjoy it now. Yeah, you know, just trying to keep this stuff alive. It's uh. It that that's one thing that people forget is this is uh spirituality is such an important pe 
piece of like people's lives and just uh yeah we think it's important we think other people should too absolutely now if you find yourself in the cleveland area make sure you stop in and say hey How's it going? Say, hey, Steven, we heard you on the radio show. We'd love to see your stuff. We'd love to, for you to explain a few things to us, and I'm sure, Steven, you'll be happy to do that. But we got to get out of here, Eric. Wow, another hour, another two hours come and gone. So until next time, guys, take care of each other, love each other, and make sure you visit the Buckland Museum of Magic, witchcraftandmagic.org. You're going to love that. The buckland.museum.org is the website. Take care. After Hours AM is a production of Midwest Radio Productions. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And please visit www.americas-most-haunted.com.